All right, guys, how you doing? Sorry about that. How you doing, guys? We're back. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right. May the Lord bless this session. Father, we need you. Lord Jesus, we need you. Holy Spirit, we, we need you. Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue to speak truth without error. Save me from stammering. Bless your people with wisdom, knowledge, understanding from your glorious holy presence. Flood us in your presence and seal us for the glory of Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yahweh, Holy Spirit. Can I put the link again? What link? To what? I don't, which, Scott, what link? Which ones? The one on Psalm 82? Mary, I hope you've been blessed, Mary, sister, with all these sessions. Okay, here's the one. Here, let me give you the link to Psalm 82. It's part one. I'm going to finish part two, God willing, this week. Remember, I'm in full-time ministry, so that's what I do. I study, I research, I write to try to provide accurate information to you guys, the body of Christ. So there goes Psalm 82. I'm going to do part two, finish part two this week, Lord willing, if you're praying for me. So by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll wait for the rest of the people to show up. Yeah. Thank you, Yana. Please, Lord. Please. Sorry. It's good. The buffering, hopefully, by the grace of God, will be less and less. If not, then I'm going to just cancel Cox. Right? See, if we ask the Holy Spirit to show up and bless our session and take over and even bless the Internet connection for the glory of Christ, then he guides our conversations in ways that we didn't plan. Like last session, I didn't plan to go that direction. But if the Holy Spirit we trust to guide us, he'll guide us to the things we need to hear, right? Isn't that true? We needed to hear what the Christian life is all about. Right? We needed to be reminded the Christian life is not about just studying. It's not just about theology and apologetics or debating that the Christian life is about being in love with God, the true God, Father, Son, Spirit, who's in love with us. The Christian life is about truly understanding and knowing Jesus and falling in love with him. Because folks, when you get to know the real Jesus, the true Jesus, you cannot help but fall in love with him if you're not dead and hardened in your sin. The only ones who do not love the true Jesus as he is are the ones who are dead in sin, hardened by sin, or are worshiping a false god and don't want to give up their idol. Okay. So I hope you learn the goal of Christianity is not just to acquire knowledge. It's not just to study apologetics or theology. It's to fall in love with him who was in love with you, who is love itself, who is life itself, Jesus of Nazareth. Right? That's the goal. We're waiting for the few more faces to show up. Here's the link again to Psalm 82, and I'll explain these articles. We'll finish John 10. You know, If I could play the song, I would, but they're going to flag me because we got people who flag me because when I play something from YouTube, they flag me. One of the most powerful songs you can hear, and it's based on Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. It's Knowing You, Jesus. Knowing You, Jesus, right? In fact, I'm going to read the passage for you. Here is the goal of the Christian life. You ready? Okay. You guys ready? I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to read the New American Standard Bible. Okay, you ready? You want to know what the goal of the Christian life is? In fact, I'm going to read verse 7. You know what? Hold on. Let me start. Let me tell you what Paul says. Here. Okay, hold on. Let me start. I was going to start 8 to 9. But here, I want to uh, start from 4 to 9. Are you ready? Are you ready? Philippians 3, 4 to 9, New American Standard Bible. Are you ready for me to read it? You guys ready to hear what the Christian life is? What it's all about? You guys hear here? Philippians 3, 4 to 9, New American Standard Bible, even though I, we use the King James still. I'm going to read it. We don't need to post it. I want to read from 4. All the way to seven so you can get the context. Guys, pay attention. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, meaning I can boast about the things I've achieved as a man in my humanity, you know. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, in his human achievements, in his ethnicity, right? 
I far more. I'm circumcised day day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I can even speak Hebrew. Many Jews can, right? I can read Hebrew. Many Jews can. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was so zealous for God, I persecuted the church, thinking I was doing God a favor. As to the righteousness which is in law, found blameless. No one could accuse me of being a lawbreaker. That's how zealous I was for honoring the law, right? You with me there? That's how zealous I was for honoring the law. But now notice what he's going to say. Why do, you, why do you think Paul is my hero and I love this man? Because of how much he loved Jesus. And I probably can be like him for the sake of glorifying Jesus. Now watch what he says. But whatever things were gained to me, these things that I thought were achievements that I can boast in, being zealous for the law and on fire for God and willing to kill people for God and go to jail for God. These things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I now lose it all. Folks, let me explain that. Let me explain what he means. I could care less about my status in the eyes of people. I could care less that as far as my Jewish countrymen were concerned, they looked upon me as someone who was blameless in keeping the law, who was zealous. I could care less about that. In modern terms, I could care less how many PhDs I got. I could care less how many degrees I got. I could care less how much money I got in the bank account, how many homes. I could care less. You know why? Because to me, it's nothing in comparison to Jesus. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's it. Everything that I've lost, I am glad because it was worth losing everything from a worldly perspective, human perspective, to know him. The value of knowing Jesus is limitless. There's not a limit on the value of being known by Jesus and knowing him intimately. You want me there? Watch what he goes on to say. For whom I've lost everything just so I can know him who loves me. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I've lost everything for him. I gladly have lost everything just to know him and belong to him and be in love with him and to be loved by him. And I count them crap. The Greek word skubalon literally means crap. It actually, it literally means shit. I considered all shit, garbage, crap, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, trying to be righteous by keeping the law, but a righteous standing that is found through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. See, that's the goal of the Christian. You understand? That's the goal of the Christian. The goal of the Christian is not to get PhDs. It's not to get degrees. It's not to be an expert in theology or great at debating and apologetics. That's not the goal of the Christian. The goal of the Christian is to know Jesus intimately, to love Jesus intimately, to be in love with Jesus and walk with him. Okay? That's the goal of the Christian. So it's okay, Cheryl. I could care less that you wanted to correct me and say couldn't care less, Cheryl. I consider what you said loss for the sake of preaching Christ and knowing him. Okay, Cheryl? Did you like that one? Oh, I tied it in. <laughs> you like that? All right. We can begin now. Come on, guys. I said, all of you going to come back? You said no, yes, and then we only got 68. We're at least 105. What happened, man? All right. Is Protestant here? So we can begin. We're going to begin. Okay. Well, they should come back and look anyway. The Protestant leave us? Okay, here. Okay, let's begin, folks. If they come, they come. What can we do? Yeah, uh, guys, guys, you want to be edified? Go learn about the coronavirus. 
It's all right. I love CP. I'm not competing with him, but come on, CP. Close down and send your 800 here. I need your 800 uh, viewers. Yeah, Luisa, if you want to get moved in your spirit and just by the power of the spirit, start bawling in love with Jesus, you got to listen to that last one. I stopped it because it really was moving. The Holy Spirit moved us in a direction just to talk about Jesus and being in love with Jesus, and it just was amazing. So I decided to keep that as a session separate from this one. Now, here's the link again. We're going to put all the links in the description box. Let me explain. Yep. Okay, sorry, guys. Even though I don't have the internet on and I'm plugged to the modem, I'm plugged to the modem, it's still, it still buffers, but hopefully not as bad. I hope it gets better. But now, why did I write those articles? Let me explain why those articles. I produce those articles as we dig deeper into John chapter 10. You guys ready to hear why I wrote those series of articles? All of those articles deal with the same theme, the divine council, the council in heaven where God reigns in heaven in the midst of his heavenly hosts, angelic creatures who serve him, right? Why don't I write those series of articles? And hopefully the regulars will come in. I wrote it particularly because of Michael Heiser, Mike Heiser. Okay, here's what I need you to listen to. Mike Heiser is an outstanding Old Testament scholar who is a top-notch evangelical Trinitarian apologist. He's a Trinitarian who loves Jesus. He's got outstanding knowledge, and I met him. He's a very humble, sweet guy. So I didn't write this because of any personal dislike towards Michael Heiser. Because you can be brothers and agree to disagree, right? But the primary reason why I wrote the series wasn't so much to refute Michael Heiser as it was to deal with his fans. Are you with me there? I have noticed the tendency... Okay, I have noticed a tendency. Can you guys hear me, by the way? I don't know if you can, because you guys are talking about Christian Prince and all. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Or am I putting you guys to sleep? Okay. I've noticed a tendency among Christians to make people that they like more than they are and to even turn them into idols. And I've noticed this pattern, right? I've noticed this with all the top name apologists. When you have great knowledge, you attract sometimes people who make you more than, they, than you are and idolize you as if everything you say is the gospel truth. And that's one thing I want to avoid for myself. I know you guys are smart enough and are protected by the Spirit and you love Jesus enough never to make me more than I am. And never to swear by everything I say because I am not an apostle or. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. We'll see what happens with buffering. Uh, I know you guys are smart enough and you love Jesus enough and the Holy Spirit guides you not to make me more than I am. Right. And never quote me as if everything I say is thus saith the Lord. Because I don't have perfect knowledge of the scriptures, I'm being perfected. So you're going to take what I say, go over the passages, re-listen to the sessions, study the passages for yourselves, and ask the Holy Spirit to show you where I'm wrong and to protect you from error, and to show you where I'm right, and then to strengthen you in the truth of that of the things I said that are from the Spirit, right? And ask the Holy Spirit to do the same work in me, to show me where I'm in error, and to correct myself and not repeat those mistakes. So... I don't want Shemunians, Shemunites. David Wood doesn't want Woodians, people who blindly follow him and idolize him. Michael Heiser, because he's a man of God, doesn't want that either. Neither does James White. The problem is, though, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Even though they're not encouraging people to idolize them, they still attract people who make them more than they are who think that everything they say is gospel truth. So if you question anything, if you question anything, then they go on the attack. So I decided to write a series of articles to silence the Heiserites. That's what I call them. And I even met Mike Heiser. I go, hey, Mike Heiser, 
I like how, how you have a group of Heiserites that follow you blindly. He started laughing. Okay. These articles were written primarily to check the Heiserites, to silence the Heiserites, and to show them as great of a scholar Michael Heiser is, he's still human, he doesn't have perfect knowledge, and he makes mistakes. So I wrote a series of articles calling into question some of his claims and showing that his claims are very weak. In fact, the evidence supports the opposite position and contradicts his assertions. Now, you may think I didn't refute him. You may think he's still right. But these articles, you need to study them in depth and prayerfully go over the passages in the context to see. Did I make a strong case to show that he's mistaken on a lot of things that he says the Bible teaches about the heavenly council, which it doesn't, right? Or I'm mistaken in my criticism of his, of him, right? That's why I produced these articles. I got really tired of people saying, well, Michael Heiser says this, and this is what it means, and not thinking critically for themselves and asking the Spirit to show them, where is Michael wrong? Where is he right? But if he says it, it was almost like it's gospel truth. Are you with me there? And that's not his fault. I'm not attacking him. That's not his fault. It's the fault of people who make scholars and apologists more than they are and idolize them. May God purify our hearts and save, the, save us from that idolatry. Okay? Is that clear? Why these articles are important? And why you need to study them? In view of the fact that I'm criticizing Mike Heiser's claims... For what the Old Testament teaches about the heavenly council, a council in heaven, there are some things he says they're right and some things he's wrong. And I'm not the only one to see where he's wrong. Peter Gentry, a world-class Old Testament scholar, and asked me to give you the link before this. A world-class Old Testament scholar has a video out. Yeah. Okay, a world-class Old Testament scholar, Peter Gentry, has a video out where he discusses Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and comes to similar conclusions that I came in my series. And in his discussion of Ezekiel 28, he mentions Mike Heiser, and he says this in the discussion. He read Mike Heiser, and he read the notes, and he found his arguments weak. He found them wanting, and he said something I've been saying. He said, Michael Heiser overemphasizes the ancient Near Eastern context. He overemphasizes the ancient Near Eastern background instead of allowing the Old Testament to speak in its own context to see when the Old Testament agrees with something that the ancient Near Eastern peoples believed and when it contradicts them. He's absolutely right. I've been saying that. Right? Everyone with me there? Peter Gentry, he's also a world-class Old Testament scholar. He has the same view and the same position about Mike, Mike Heiser's arguments that I have. And we can agree to disagree and respect each other. But when you make people more than they are and idolize them, then you become blind robot bots who are now sinning because you're committing idolatry instead of seeing him for what he is, a great man of God, a great scholar, but he's not infallible. So let me hear a variety of opinions and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth and save me from error. No, it's him and him alone. And it's not just Heiser. Even my dear brother, James White, he has followers that do that with him. And I call them Soloidians. You like all these names I came up with? You have Heiserites. You have Soloidians. Right? And you have Woodians. Anyway, with that said, are we ready now? Are we ready by the grace of God? Are we ready by the maker, grace of God? Hit the like button. Let's make these... Videos go viral. Let's bring in more people. And we trust Jesus Christ, Lord, to bless the connection. Lord, for your glory. You don't need me. We need you. Okay. So let's go back to John 10 and unpack it. Let me answer a question that was asked of me in the comment section. Someone told me, is it possible that though Jesus' interpretation of John 10, in John 10, Jesus' interpretation of John 10 concerning Psalm 82.6 is about human rulers, could it also be referring to spirit rulers that work in and through human rulers? In other words, when you go to John 10 and you have to have listened to yesterday's session or you're going to be lost, and you need to re-listen re to that session by the grace of God's spirit, right, until it becomes second nature. When our Lord Jesus quotes Psalm 82, verse 6 in John 10, 34, and we'll revisit that in a moment. 
In the context, Jesus' argument only works if Psalm 82.6 is referring to human rulers. And I explained why in yesterday's session. We'll talk about that shortly. Make sure you listen to both sessions. Otherwise, you won't understand the meat of the, the sessions. And we want meat for the glory of Christ. Okay. Even though Jesus' interpretation of Psalm 82.6 only makes sense if it's human rulers, could it also be referring to spirit rulers in the heavenly realms that use the human rulers as puppets, as instruments that they work in and through? Absolutely, yes. Let me repeat that again. As far as the Bible is concerned, and here's where you need to listen because you're going to learn a, lot, a little bit about how the world operates and how the world runs after the fall. After the fall of Satan and Adam and Eve, how does the world run? How does the world operate? As far as the Bible is concerned, you have the kingdom of darkness. You have Satan and his evil spirit beings, evil angels, working together and trying to influence the world, influence governments, influence societies, human rulers to destroy the earth, to corrupt the earth with evil, injustice, and immorality. God bless you, Panagi. Lord willing, tomorrow I'll be on much earlier. And guys, pray for me tomorrow. I thought today was the day. It's actually tomorrow. My big date is tomorrow, Friday, which is Friday for you, at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I thought it was today. So pray for a miracle. But now follow with me. According to the Bible, you have evil rulers, principalities in the heavenly realms, working in and through human agencies, human governments, human kingdoms, human rulers, to bring about destruction, chaos, and the spread of evil and immorality in their opposition to God's rule. Everyone with me there? Is it working? Can you guys hear? Is everything okay? Okay, because someone said it's frozen. It's scaring me. Let him know it's frozen for him. So even though Psalm 82, as far as Jesus is concerned, is referring to human rulers, does it also and can it also include spirit rulers that work through human rulers? Yes. Guy Wilkerson beat me to it. Let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. The answer is yes. It could be referring to human rulers and their heavenly counterparts, to heavenly rulers and their earthly counterparts. If I'm not making sense, ask me to clarify. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So you're not battling a human being, a human ruler. You're battling that evil power authority that's using that human ruler, inspiring that human ruler, working th through that human ruler to persecute you and oppress you. Making sense? Who's not getting this? Everyone getting it? Before I move on to the next point. Okay. Daniel 10, 13. Daniel 10, 13. Okay. Follow with me here. Daniel 10, 13. Exactly, Andrew Martin. I'll come to that in a minute. Daniel 10, 13. Okay. The angel comes to Daniel and tells him, though your pray prayer was answered immediately, it took me 21 days to reach you. Though the day you prayed, God answered you and sent me to give you the answer to your message, it took me 21 days to deliver the message. What would cause or prevent a powerful spirit ruler from God's kingdom to reach Daniel in time so he was detained for 21 days? Let's read. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. Folks, pay attention. The prince of the realm of Persia, because at this time, Medes Persians had conquered the Babylonians and made their capital in Babylon. And he says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia stopped me, resisted me for 21 days, which is why I didn't reach you the very first day that you prayed and you were answered. He delayed me from reaching you for 21 days. Now, let me explain the practical implication of that in a minute, but pay attention. 
But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Do you see what he's saying? The prince of the kingdom of Persia stopped me from reaching you with the answer from God for 21 days. He hindered me until Michael, another powerful being, came, took up the fight to release me, and now I'm here to give you the answer. Folks, what prince of the kingdom of Persia would be able to resist a spirit creature, a mighty spirit being from God's heavenly company? Is this referring to the human ruler of Persia or a spiritual ruler of Persia? Amen, Mike. Who is this ruler of Persia that could see an angelic creature, even though... Angels are invisible to our eyes unless God removes the veil. He could see him and stop him from coming into Babylon. No, you're not coming. I resist you. And to get into a fight and stops him. It's not necessarily Satan, no. But is it a human ruler or a spirit ruler? Do you want me to block you for serious, brother? Not even Nebuchadnezzar's spirit, because Nebuchadnezzar became a believer, and this is during the reign of the Persians. The Babylonians had been destroyed. So it's a spirit ruler, right? So how many rulers did the Persians have? They had two. Pay attention. Persia had two rulers, a spiritual one and a human one. And the spiritual one was working through the human one, influencing him and guiding him. In other words, if you believe in the Holy Bible... Each government, each ruler may have human authorities, but ultimately they are governed and moved and inspired by spiritual authorities working through them. Can you block this guy, this dog that's here just to distract? You guys, you see this guy mocking and you don't do anything? Come on, guys. Remove him. You want me there? So let me ask the question. Do you see from Daniel 10, 13, there's a spiritual ruler of Persia who's resisting the spirit being from God, and he's powerful enough to prevent him from reaching Daniel time, so it takes him 21 days to reach Daniel. But there is also a human ruler of Persia, Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes. So what did you learn right here? What did you learn right here? You have a spiritual ruler working through a human ruler and inspiring a human ruler and influencing a human ruler to make decisions that bring corruption and evil in a land. Right? Now let's look at Daniel 10, 20 to 21. Air Church, the implication of this teaching is every kingdom, every government have spirit rulers guiding them, Air Church. It's not just Persia, so you're not getting the point. Now, Air Church, here's the proof. Daniel 10, 20 to 21. Then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. So even Greece, Grecia has a prince. Persia has a prince and the prince of Greece. Grecia has a prince. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Did you catch it? Persia has a prince. Grecia, Greece has a prince. Michael is going to back me up to fight these princes. But hold on. Greece has a human prince. Persia has a human prince. Are you telling me human princes are able to resist you, spiritual beings, whom they don't see? No, 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 no. We're talking about the spiritual rulers of Persia and Greece that use the human rulers as their pawns. Everyone with me here? If you believe the Bible, you're going to have to believe this is real, more real than you can imagine, that there's an actual spirit realm, a real spirit realm that influences the earthly realm. So if you believe this, you know what that means? All governments and kingdoms are influenced by the spirit realm. And if a government has opposed God, turned its back on God, 
you better believe the spirit rulers that are influencing them are evil, unclean, wicked spirit rulers. And you see it played out in the U.S. Here you have Trump, whose vice president is an evangelical Christian. By the way, I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. And I'm not encouraging you to vote for Trump. Don't misunderstand me. But here's my point. You see Trump is pretty much fighting for the life of unborn children. And his vice president is an evangelical Christian. And trying to fight for Christian values. And you see the onslaught of the Democrats in trying to destroy this man's life and bury him. That means what you have, and I'm not saying Trump is God's man. Don't misquote me on this, please. I don't want anyone to quote me. No, from what I checked, Mike Pence is evangelical Christian. But even if he's Catholic, put that aside. You're still not getting the point. And don't make this a battle about denominations. Okay? Focus on the point. Okay. In... The White House, you have people who are trying to spread corruption, evil, murder, and calling it pro-choice, even trying to sabotage the Constitution and bring in communism, and you have others who are trying to fight for what they believe to be Judeo-Christian values. And I'm not saying Jesus is for Trump. No, he's not. Jesus is neither Republican nor Democrat. He's neither. Jesus isn't for any party. We have to belong to the party of Christ. He's the king of kings. Please don't misquote me saying, Sam was saying vote for Trump. No, uh, Trump is a sinner too. And he's done a lot of wicked things and immoral things. He's not my savior. He's not my hero. And my trust is not in Trump. Okay. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that it's not just human authorities that are fighting each other. Behind these human authorities are evil spirits or righteous spirits that are working through these human authorities, and there's a clash. That's what I'm trying to say. You with me there? So don't you dare misquote me saying, Sam said Trump is Jesus' agent, and he's an angel, and he's righteous, and he's a Christian, and the Republican Party is... No, it's not. Republican Party is not the party of Jesus. The Democratic Party is not the party of Jesus. The Independent Party is not the party of Jesus. Jesus doesn't belong to any parties, doesn't support any parties, doesn't endorse any parties. Jesus is for the kingdom of heaven, and he's the king of all kings and lord of all lords, and all parties must submit to his party. That's the gospel truth. With me there? Is that clear? Please don't misrepresent me. I just, well, however you vote, vote with Jesus in view. Vote with Jesus' will in mind. His kingdom, his rule, his commands. Keep that in mind when you vote. Jesus, if you're standing right here in front of me, how would you want me to vote? And if Jesus says, they're all corrupt, okay, then I'm not voting. You get that's something between you and Jesus. That's between you and Jesus. Whether you vote or you don't vote, as long as you do it for the glory of Jesus. And if your conscience is killing you, man, I can't vote for Trump or this guy. Don't vote. Don't sin. Don't go against your conscience. You get my point? Who say you got to vote? My citizenship is in heaven. But it doesn't mean I won't try to influence the world to follow Jesus' kingdom and his rule. Our job as Christians in the world is to be salt of the earth and light of the world. Influence everyone, governments and authorities and kings, to fall in love with Jesus, to submit with Jesus, and transform them to now implement Jesus' rule in our life on this earth, on this planet, until he comes and fully implements it. King of kings, that's between you and the Lord. Don't worry about it. You don't answer to me. Don't tell me how you vote. Please. I'm not saying this as a sermon to tell me. How, please don't. You're, if you are, you're not getting my point. Are you with me there? You're not getting my point. The only reason why I brought the White House is because I'm an American. I see the evil 
at work, fighting and eating one another up, eating each other alive, and trying to destroy men and women and slander them and imprison them in order to destroy the country and turn it for worse, not for better. And if you don't think America is getting worse and that the demonic influence and the demonic power over America is not getting stronger, then you're asleep. Who would have imagined 20 years ago that we would have bathrooms, right, for men and women and transgenders? Who would imagine 20 years ago that all the states would vote for same-sex marriages? Who would imagine 20 years ago that we'd be having a debate whether you can identify someone as a male who's a male or you'll be violating their conscience if you call them male, though they identify as female? You get Who would imagine that 20 years ago? If you don't see how fast the power of darkness is spreading in your land, you are blind, my friend. I went to a library and I saw a bathroom where I had a sign of a male and a female and also for anyone who identifies as a female that was a male or a female that uh, open. They got, you know, you get my point? You understand my point? I'm not trying to get political. I'm trying to tie in with the Bible. Understand what I'm trying to do. The Bible told you that you have a spirit realm filled with evil, unclean rulers whose king is Satan that are working in the earthly realm through human governments and agencies and rulers to spread their kingdom, their darkness, their evil, their corruption, their immorality. And they oppose anyone who tries to implement the rule of God and strikes back at the kingdom of darkness. That's the point I'm trying to make. And since the Bible is real and God is real, and he's the same yesterday, today and forever. The spirit realm is real and the spirit realm is still influencing the earthly realm. Who's not getting this? Who's not getting this? Everyone got my point? Now let me tell you how influential the spirit realm is. Even on the life of believers. Let's go back to Daniel 10, 13. I hope you're learning. I hope you're benefiting. I hope it's showing you the depth of scripture and making you stand more in awe of scripture and more in love with Jesus and why you got to cling to Jesus because it's only by his blood, his cross, his authority, you can destroy the kingdom of darkness. Daniel 10, 13. Read this with me. Watch here again. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now let's read the context of this so you can see what his point was. Let's start at Daniel 10. Let's read 10 to 13. Yeah, guys, hit that like button. We had 105. We're down 95. Man, uh, nobody likes me. <laughs> Everyone likes CP and David Wood. Daniel 10 verses 10 to 13. Watch here. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Guys, please pay attention so you can learn and benefit. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Now watch this. Notice what he's going to say. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, folks, pay attention. For from the first day thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come <clears throat> for thy words. So if it was the first day, why did it take you 21 days later to show up? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 21 days. Did you catch it? Though you were answered the first day you prayed and fasted, because if you read Daniel 10, it says that Daniel prayed and fasted and didn't stop praying and fasting until he received an answer. And so he prayed and fasted 21 days. And the angel saying, you were heard the first day. And I came the first day to answer you. But the, the angel ruling Persia detained me. Folks, implication. Sometimes God answers you right away. 
but you don't get the answer to your prayer because there's a battle in the spirit realm that has to be overcome that's blocking the answer to your prayer. You understand what you just read? Did you understand what you just read? Amen, Jeremiah. The Bible confirms your vision, not the other way around. So praise God for that. Folks, the spirit realm is so real. Exactly, LD. The spirit realm is so real that you'll be praying and God answers you. But the answer to your prayer is being hindered by the battle in the spirit realm where the righteous angels are being prevented from these wicked angels to bring about the answer to your prayer and the outcome in your life that God has destined until they remove these satanic obstacles. That's how real the spirit realm is. That's how real the spirit realm is. Are you, is it sinking in? You understand what you just read? We lost more people than we gained. I guess this is too much. I think it's heresy. Who didn't get it? So the spirit realm is more real than you think. And the battle is more real than you think. And that your prayers are even affected by what takes place in the spirit realm. And the lesson to learn, the lesson to learn is this. Don't stop praying and don't lose faith in praying because you don't know if God has already answered you, but you just have to wait for the answer to reach you. Because notice Daniel, he didn't stop praying because he had no doubt God was going to answer him. And he didn't stop praying and fasting until he received an answer. You guys got into a side discussion. All Democrats are not for abortions. Who gives a damn? Who's talking about parties? I was trying to make a point. We went back to Democrats. So you're more concerned about Democrats, Republicans, about the Bible. Okay. You got it now? You understand? Let me repeat again. And I hope... Marsha's here too. Let me repeat again. The spirit realm is so real that it even affects the answers to your prayers because a battle is taking place where the demonic realm is trying to prevent your prayers that are answered to reach you. And so a battle is going on until that satanic obstacle is removed and then you receive the answer to your prayers, which means don't be discouraged. And don't lose hope because there is a battle in the spirit realm that may be affecting the timeliness of your prayer from being answered. And you got to keep praying, keep fasting, keep trusting that the prayer will reach you once the satanic obstacles are removed. You see? Because... God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The spirit realm is still alive, still doing what it does, as it did in the time of Daniel. Exactly. Some angels are more powerful than others. Now, with that said, do you see now the connection between your human rulers and evil, evil uh, spirit rulers? So, a human ruler is influenced, if not outright controlled, by a spirit ruler. So when Jesus defines Psalm 82, 6 in reference to human rulers, could that also include spirit rulers? Of course, because Jesus even told us that the Jews who rejected him belonged to their father, the devil, who was a murderer and a liar, which is why they want to kill him, because they're carrying out the desires of their father, John 8, 44. Of course. Of course. And as... A a Al D said, look at my situation. Over two years of a demonic attack on me by a corrupt, evil, 
spiritual whore of a judge belonging to Satan who tried to make my life miserable and punishing me for the sin of my ex-wife, right? Putting me in a $45,000 debt that I did not accrue, but my ex-wife's attorneys put on me with the judge's permission for over two years. And I have not seen my girl since June. I know how real the spirit realm is. But if I tell you the things that God is doing, things he's been doing to show me his miraculous hand of pr protection, doors that have been opening up out of nowhere, you'll be blown away. Guys, I haven't told you the miracles I'm seeing before my eyes, how everything falls in place. I came to the state, and in this state, he kept opening one door after another, showing me it may look like they're going to consume you. It may look like they're going to win. It may look like you're going to be destroyed. Not to worry. Do not be afraid. I am with you. And if God is with me, who can be against me? And he's opening little doors that's blowing my mind. Right away, I came here. I got my license. And if I told you I got my license, you'll be blown away. I was able to ch change the registration of my car to this state without any problems in a matter of minutes. The Lord blessed me with now a business, an LLC. And by the way, for those of you who did not know, if you watch the name of my patron, it's Christ for the World, because now I have an LLC, Christ for the World LLC, which means by the grace of God, the blessings that you give for the ministry are protected and evil lawyers can't touch them. Glory to Jesus. See? So even through this two-year demonic battle using demonic human agents who hate me for no reason other than demons are are pricking them and influencing them jesus is showing up one door after another and one door closing another opening and you know what the message of the lord has been to me for over two years one person after another and in fact even on let's say internet you know what verse God kept giving me Exodus 14, verse 14. Exodus 14, verse 14. Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. You don't know how many times people have quoted that verse for me. Hey, you know what? The Lord put in my heart to give you this verse. You don't know how many times people have given me that verse independently from each other, not knowing for two years. Remember what I said? God speak to us, speaks to us either in dreams and visions, or he puts ideas in our minds and our hearts. And he definitely speaks clearly in the Bible, but he can also use multiple witnesses. And you know what I've been hearing from multiple witnesses? Multiple witnesses? Be patient. The Lord is going to rise in a way to blow your mind. You'll be shocked at the miracles about to do. But the Lord wants you to know, be patient. Be patient. Be patient. That's what I've been hearing for two years from one person after another. And they don't know. And they don't know. They're all telling me the same thing. Exodus 14, verse 14, Lisa. The Lord Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. And you know why, why that verse is amazing? It's the story of the Israelites reaching the Red Sea. And they couldn't go any further because of the sea in front of them. And the chariots of Pharaoh was approaching. And so they thought it's an impossible situation. How in the world can he save us now? We're dead. And you know what he said? Really? I'm, gonna, I'm even going to split the Red Sea in front of your eyes so you can walk on level ground. What they saw was an impossible situation. That's it. We're stuck, folks. The sea is in front of us. 600,000 men, not counting women and children, with livestock and property. How in the world are we going to cross this? That's it. We're dead. And they even complained to Moses. Was there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die? And that's when God said to them, Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. Even that Red Sea is no obstacle for you, God Almighty. Even that Red Sea is nothing before the God of the impossible. And he goes, watch. Watch my glory. And he split it. Walk. And then as the chariots came, Every Israelite made it to the other side. Now watch. Where are your enemies now? Israel, where are your enemies now?
You looked in the natural. You looked with human eyes and saw the impossible. But you took your eyes off the God of the impossible. Do you not know I am the God who spoke the entire creation into being from nothing? What is the Red Sea before me when I created it? And the Red Sea even knows the voice of her God and master. Is there anything impossible for me? But you understand what he was teaching them? See, at times, because I'm weak and fleshly, I focus in the natural realm, and I lose my focus on the Lord, and I get afraid and I panic. And Jesus is saying, Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. I am the God of the impossible. I will split the Red Sea for you like I did for Israel. Because he is real, he is God. Okay? Okay? But notice when God acted for Israel, they remain 400 years as slaves in Egypt. Talk about being patient. 400 years they had to wait for the salvation of God. 400 years. And I'm complaining about two years. What about Joseph? How many years was Joseph... Separated from his family. How many years did Joseph live without ever seeing his brothers and his father? And I'm complaining I haven't held my daughters in my arms for two years. You get my point? You, you, get, you understand what I'm saying, right? God's timing is perfect. He will act at the perfect time, though we wish he acts sooner. And that's why I know, I know God will work it out for me. Not because I deserve it. I don't. Just like the Israelites didn't deserve it. Because he's a gracious God and a good God. And he's given an anointed, anointing to glorify him. And he'll allow no one to destroy that anointing on my life to glorify him till I die. I know that. What hurts me is, I'm going to miss out on these years. My daughters are going to grow up and these years won't be redeemed. They'll be gone. But you know what? Even though they'll be gone from me, God will make those years that we're together even better and more fruitful. You get it? Everyone clear? So it's not so much I'm trying to preach, but what I'm trying to do is Make it practical theology. Teach you the theology of the Bible and how it applies to us today. So it's not just head knowledge. You're reading about a real being, a real spirit realm that truly influences the earthly realm in order to learn from these examples how the spirit realm works and why you need to be patient and endure and praying and fasting because God will answer in the way that's best for you, even though the answer may not be the way you want him to answer, because he knows better than you what's best for you, but the answer may not come to you at the time that you want. Did you learn this? See, this I'm not just giving you theology. I want you to learn from this theology how to apply it in your lives, because God is real, the spirit realm is real, and these were given to teach us. Clear? Let me repeat again what I just said. Do not lose heart in praying and fasting to receive an answer. God will answer you, but it may not be the answer you want to hear because he knows better than you what's best for you. For example, let me give you a silly example. God, I like that girl. Please let me marry her. And she goes and she falls away with someone else. Why, God, why? And then you see the life of that girl or that man. I'm just using girls. I'm a guy. Here she is. She's now in her third marriage. She's now shacking up with guys left and right. And God says, when are you going to start thanking me? Because that could have been you. But then we insist, no, God, this is the one for me. Even though God keeps telling you, no, she's not. No, he's not. That's not the one for you. Trust my wisdom. You will regret it. No, God, she is the one. He is the one. You get married, you're divorced with several kids. And now God says, you see, son? 
You see, daughter? When I said no, it's not because I wanted you to be miserable. I said no because I know better than you what's best for you. And I know this wasn't for you, but you insisted. So I had to let you experience and learn the hard way, though I didn't want you to go through this. Exactly, Cheryl. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not yet. So God will answer you. But sometimes in the spirit realm, the answer is delayed because of the war. The spirit realm, the evil spirit trying to hinder the answer to prayer to reach you. So a battle takes place until the satanic obstacles are removed and your prayer is answered. I don't know why these guys are hearing this filthy legend of the devil, this filthy dog who's upset at his mother for giving birth to him as a dog, and you guys just letting him do what he's doing. Right? Don't let these blasphemous swines of the devil distract. So are you learning a lot, not just about the spirit realm, but its practical implication on your life as a believer? Are you learning a lot? Not just about the spirit realm, but the practical implication it has on your life. Folks, if you believe the Bible, you have to believe this is real. There is a real spirit realm. There are real evil spirits, evil rulers working in the earthly realm to corrupt lives, to destroy lives. And there are also righteous angels of God fighting them for our sake. And don't lose heart because we have the victory. Christ is risen. The tomb is empty. Christ is alive forever and ever, and by the blood of his cross, he has destroyed the kingdom of darkness, and if we're covered by his blood, sealed by his love, filled with the Spirit, we are more than conquerors. Okay? Sinking in? Sinking in? Do you want to make sure it's sinking in? So to answer the question, even though Jesus is referring to human rulers, he, he identifies Psalm 82, 6 as a reference to human rulers. Could it not also include the spirit rulers that work through human rulers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let me give you another passage that shows that when God punishes the spirit rulers, he also punishes their earthly counterparts, meaning the spirit rulers, when they're judged, their human counterparts, the human rulers that are influenced by them, through whom they work, are also punished. He punishes both. When he punishes the king of Babylon, he also punishes the spirit ruler using the king of Babylon. When he destroys Pharaoh, he also destroys that evil spirit working through Pharaoh. Do you want proof of it? That when God punishes an evil ruler, an evil kingdom, he's also punishing the spirit rulers that influence that kingdom and are working through that human ruler. You want further proof? Exodus 12, 12. Exodus 12, 12. Thank you, Chris Dino. Lord bless you too, brother. Exodus 12, 12. Here's further proof. It was supposed to be Jesus' gospel, Jesus, John's gospel, part two. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I'll smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. Did you catch it? See, when I punish the Egyptians and I punish Pharaoh, I'm also going to destroy their gods. Do you see it? Are you making the connection now? When God punishes the human ruler, he also is punishing the spiritual counterpart. Those evil spirits working through them, whom they wrongly worship as gods. Yes, Louisa Capel. Paul says behind every idol, behind every false god is a demon, an evil spirit. So they think they're worshiping a God, whereas they're worshiping that demon who has deceived them into thinking he or she is a God. Let me prove that to you, Louisa. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 21. One Rachel means yes, two means no. 
That's our code word. But you can say yes or no. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 21. You know I'm going to have to do a part three on this, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 21. Luisa, pay attention. The gods of the nations, the idols, are they simply just empty idols or are there a real spiritual beings attached to those idols? Here you go. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 to 21. What's, what say I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? An idol is nothing. It's a statue. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of the devil. So, Louisa, see what you just learned from Paul. The Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans, when they worship Zeus or Hermes or Artemis, they were not worshiping gods and goddesses, but evil spirits, demons and devils, masquerading as gods and goddesses to dupe them into taking them as gods and goddesses and to sacrifice to them. Everyone with me? Do you catch it now? So when God punishes a human ruler and a wicked kingdom, he's not just punishing the human ruler. He's also attacking their gods and destroying them. It's both the spirit rulers and the human rulers that the spirit rulers are working through. I know you're being humble, guy, by saying you know this. <laughs> Is it clear now? Exactly, Luisa. Is it clear? Is it sinking in? Everyone getting this? You see how much meat and depth there is to the Bible. How beautiful and majestic the Bible is because the God of the Bible is beautiful and majestic. And how it has the answers to all these problems. Why we have problems. See, if you study the Bible, you'll know. Because there's a spirit realm. There is a demon there is a devil and evil spirits that are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every second of the minute of every hour because they don't sleep, they don't stop, and their intent is spread as much corruption and evil and immorality and destroy as many lives as possible and turn as many people away from God. Why do you think when a calamity happens, the first one you blame is God? You don't blame demons. You don't say, look what Satan did. You say, God, look what God did. And Satan knows that. He knows the reaction of people is to blame God for something that an evil spirit has caused. And Satan is smart. He knows if he brings a calamity in your life. You're going to point the finger at God, and that's his intention. Satan's intention, Satan's intention is to get you to blame God for evil things that happen to you, which is the result of Satan or an evil spirit, in order to make you hate God and turn your back on him. That's his intention. Because the last person you think is the devil did it. You're thinking, God, why did you allow this to happen? Why did you allow this car accident to happen or this tsunami to happen? Or to... And you blame God. He's smart. He knows his job. He knows what to do and how to do it in order to get you to hate God and turn your back on God. Okay? So have you seen the case from the Bible behind human rulers are spirit rulers, and these spirit rulers working through human rulers to bring corruption, destruction, chaos. Now, let me show you that in another example. Oh, man, LD, he's been doing it from day one. He's the best at it. He's the best psychologist. He is the best instigator and divider among create creatures. No one can outdo Satan among creatures in causing division, disunity, and knowing the psychology of the human mind and what makes human beings tick and giving it to them in such a way to turn them against God. Can I give you another example? Where when God punishes, when God punishes 
a people he's also punishing their false gods and goddesses. Can I give you another example? You guys interested or are you getting bored with all this? Can I give you another example? Isaiah 46 verse 1. God prophesies the destruction of Babylon. God prophesies the destruction of Babylon. And when he destroys the Babylonian king, when he destroys Babylon, guess who also he's destroying? Bel boweth down, Nembo stoopeth. Their idols were upon the beast and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy loaden. They are burned to the weary beast. Did you catch it? Nebo and Bel were the gods of the Babylonians. Bel was the, was the name for Marduk. So God says to the Babylonians, when I punish you, I'm going to destroy your gods, Marduk and Nebo. You catch it? Do you see what he just said? Babylon, when I destroy you, I'm destroying your gods. When I destroy you, I destroy the demons attached to your idols influencing you. Now let's read 1 Samuel 5, verse 4. 1 Samuel 5, verse 4. And 1 Samuel 6, 9. Much deeper than we think. And the Lord Jesus enabled me to recall the passages correctly. 1 Samuel 5, 4. And when they arose early on the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of Jehovah. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Did you catch it? The Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant into their temple. They came the next morning and they saw the statue of their false god Dagon broken before the Ark of the Covenant with Dagon's head bowing to the Ark. Do you know what that was a sign of? That demon attached to that statue has been destroyed and humbled before me because the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant represented God's visible presence with his people. God's visible presence with his people. You with me there? God's visible presence with his people. Let me prove it to you. 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. Forgive me. I don't know why I said 1 Samuel 6, 9. 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. Watch here. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring... From thence the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Did you catch it? The Ark of the Covenant represents Jehovah dwelling in the midst of the cherubim. Okay? 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. Watch here. Sorry about that. Okay. Second Samuel 6, verse 2. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring upon, up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of Jehovah of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. Did you catch what it just said? The ark was named with the name of Jehovah. The ark was named with the name of Jehovah. Why? Because Jehovah dwelt upon the ark and his visible presence was there. So the ark of the covenant reminded the Israelites, God's visible presence is right here. That's why when the Philistines looked at the ark, God struck down thousands of them in a day. 1 Samuel 6, 19. 1 Samuel 6, 19. First Samuel six nineteen. Watch here. Don't don't waste your time. Focus, guys. Don't let these demons distract you. 
1 Samuel 6, 19, and he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the Ark of Jehovah. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and three score and 10 men. 50,000 and 70 men he smote for simply looking at the Ark of the Covenant. He killed them dead. Did you catch it? Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant was the physical sign. God's visible presence is here. He's placed his presence uniquely here. So if you touch it, you're touching God. And if you look at it, you're looking at God. And if you look at him in an unworthy, unholy manner, instant death. You don't believe me? Joshua 7, verse 6. And I'm going to tie it all. I'll tie this all. Together, as the Holy Spirit enables me to recall all these passages for the glory of Christ. You're getting a lot of meat today. Joshua 7, verse 6. Look what Joshua and the elders did. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of Jehovah until eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. Why is Joshua and the elders falling before this physical ark of the covenant? Why are they following, falling before it? Because they know that this ark, God is now present upon it in a unique way, though we may not see it. So when they bow to the ark, it's not the ark they're bowing to. They're bowing to God whose presence is right there. Okay. The contrast is this. The ark of the covenant... God's presence was associated with it, attached to it. The idols of the nations, demons are attached to them. You with me there? God's presence is attached to the Ark of the Covenant. Demonic presence are attached to the idols of the nations. That's why, that's why in 1 Samuel 5, 4, the statue of Dagon was broken and its head bowed down before the ark because that statue had a demon attached to it, whereas the ark had God's presence attached to it. So in the presence of God, that demon was destroyed. That demon was destroyed. The further proof that the Ark of the Covenant was the physical artifact, the physical icon, that God's presence is attached to it. So God is really present here in a unique way, though you don't see his presence. But to remind you, God is now present, so tread lightly. Exodus 25, 18 to 22. We got a lot of meat in this session. You know, I got to do a part three, right? But tomorrow I said I was going to do Melchizedek, Hebrews 7 3. Okay. Exodus 25, 18 to 22. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Pay attention. God is telling Moses, fashion an icon, a statue. Wow. God is having them fashion a physical icon, a statue? Yep. Read. Read, read carefully. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, what shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat, right? And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings, physical icon of spirit creatures that dwell in heaven, Covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look unto another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Now watch this. Okay. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon, above the, upon the ark, above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee, have fellowship with thee, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Wow. Number one, 
God himself is commanding the fashioning of a physical icon of a mercy seat with two cherubim with wings outstretched. Number two, God says, that's the place where I'm going to appear to you, Moses, visibly in a cloud. I'm going to descend between the cherubim and speak to you from that ark face to face as a sign to all of you. When you see this ark, be reminded my presence is attached to it, so I'm here in a unique way. So tread lightly, lest I strike you. Sinking in for everybody? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 19 to 20 again, the contrast. Exactly, Matthew George. That's what it's supposed to represent. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 to 20. What, what say I then that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So notice the contrast. Guys, let it sink in. The idols of pagans, the idols of the nations who don't worship God, those idols that represent their gods and goddesses also have a spiritual presence attached to them, a demonic one. The Ark of the Covenant has a spiritual presence attached to it, the presence of the infinite, holy, triune God. So I've given you ample proof from the scriptures that when God destroys a nation, he destroys its gods and goddesses, the demons that have deceived the nations into worshiping them as gods and goddesses. Everyone got it? The final passage now, the final passage now. That shows you there's a connection between human rulers and spiritual rulers. The heavenly realm working through the earthly realm. Spirit creatures of darkness working through human agencies and governments and rulers to spread corruption and evil and immorality. Okay. Isaiah 24, 21. And Lord willing, I got to do a part three. Isaiah 24, 21. You guys got a lot of me today. And it shall come to pass in the day that Jehovah, the Lord, shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Do you see the connection again? Do you guys see the connection? Jehovah will punish the hosts of the high ones on high and the earthly rulers. When he punishes one, he punishes the other because they're connected. Now, post again Ephesians 6.12 with Isaiah 24.21, back to back. Ephesians 6.12 and Isaiah 24.21, back to back. Watch here. I'm medical doctor. Okay. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And it shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Who's not seeing this? Do you, have, do you guys now have eyes to see and ears to see? Eyes to see. <laughs> Not eyes to hear. Eyes to see and ears to hear by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. Are you seeing what the Bible tells you about the reality you live in? The world you live in is permeated by the heavenly realm, by spiritual rulers of darkness that are working day and night in the earthly realm through human rulers, governments, and agencies, and even corrupt demonic judges like the one who's after me. If you don't think she's possessed of the devil and demonized to destroy me, then you guys are blind.
But by your prayers, by your fasting, by the blood of Jesus shielding me, she will lose and she'll be crushed under the feet of Jesus as he protects us and protects me and my daughters because we belong to him. Everyone got it now? Sinking in? That's right, Rachel. Pray. Lord willing, tomorrow is another big date in Illinois, though I'm not there, where that wicked, demonic judge, filled with the devil, is going to try to come against me. Pray against her. Plead the blood of Jesus against her and the blood of Jesus covering me and my daughters for victory so I'm free to travel to serve the Lord and God keeps her far away from me, her and those corrupt lawyers, those agents of the devil. Okay? It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow, Marcy. I thought it was today. So everyone with me there? When you say I know where she is, who, who is she? I don't have no idea what you're talking about. I know where she is. Everyone got it now? It's sinking in. So to answer the question again, though Jesus is interpreting Psalm 82, 6 in reference to human rulers who are called gods, though they're corrupt. Yeah. Matthew McCarroll, do you want to get blocked for being silly? I don't know if you think you're being slick and cute and funny. You're not. You're being a nuisance, right? So even though Jesus is interpreting Psalm 82, 6, in reference to human rulers, when you mention a human ruler, whether you like it or not, that human ruler is connected with a spirit ruler. And I've given you ample proof in this session for those connections. Go back, re-listen to the session. Go back, study those articles that will be in the description box. Study them over and over again. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you where I'm wrong, to save you from error, and convict me to show me where I'm wrong. And to strengthen us in the truth of his word, to live it out and love it and proclaim it for the glory of Jesus and pass it on to others. Any evil spirit ruler can't be a righteous angel standing before God. He has to be a fallen angel or messenger. So to, uh, the answer to your question is answered in your question. If this spirit ruler is opposing God's will and spreading corruption and evil and immorality and strengthening evildoers to spread corruption and evil, then that spirit ruler cannot be a righteous messenger serving God. So he must be a fallen messenger opposing God. And that's what the word angel means, messenger. Amen, Grace. Amen, Rachel. Okay, now let me get you the link to Peter Gentry, the one I was talking about. Hold on. And guys, do pray that if God wants me to do ministry, to give me the health I need to get healthier, the holiness to delight his heart, not to be a hypocrite, to truly love him and live for him, and also for the provisions that the Lord will stir parts to partner with us financially to do this work and not worry about finances for the glory of Jesus. And you can do that through the Patreon pages. By sending it to Christ for the world. But let me get you that that um, video. I think it's very important. Hold on. Get it. Sorry about that. Hold on, guys. Wait. We'll be done. It's Peter Gentry, his view of Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, which is similar to what I've done. I have sessions on it. And he criticizes Michael Heiser and says he overdoes things, which I agree. I agree. Great scholar, but he's not infallible. Neither am I. Neither is first and last. The closest thing to infallibility is Protestant Reformation. And he scares me. Hold on. Let me get it for you. Okay. Here you go. Excellent video. Excellent video. And you know he's right, by the way. And his criticism of Michael, Michael Heiser, you know why he's right? You know I know he's right? Michael Heiser is mistaken here, though he's a great scholar and evangelical Trinitarian brother. Do you know why I know Peter Gentry's right in this regard? Anyone know why? How do I know that Peter Gentry is right, not Michael Heiser? 
even though they're both great scholars, Trinitarian who love Jesus. Can anyone tell me why Peter Gentry is right? Come on, guys. Who can tell me? Because he agrees with me. That's when you know you're right. Anytime your interpretation agrees with me, know you're right. And repent when you disagree with me, or I'll lay hands on you and bless you. All right. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ lives. Jesus Christ is life. He is reality. One with the Father and the Spirit. Remember who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is the one who told John in Revelation 1, 17, 18. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the living one. You did die and you destroyed the power of death, the grave, sin and Satan. And you're alive forevermore. And death and Hades are in your hands. And we trust in you. We cling to you. We cleave to you by your Holy Spirit. We plead your blood upon us, Lord Jesus, and upon our loved ones. My daughters, seal us for your glory and save us from the kingdom of darkness and the children of the kingdom of darkness. In my case, this judge, silence her, Lord Jesus, and arise for our defense. We love you, Son of God, and we trust in you and we hope in you. You are risen, risen indeed. Maranathe. Father, have mercy. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. We trust in you. I trust in you. Jesus, we trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, tomorrow I'll be on discussing Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, 3, chapter 7, verse 3. Lord willing, tomorrow at 5 p.m., between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's New York time. Between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's New York Canadian time. Guys, make sure to re-listen to both sessions. Study the material and pass it on. And the links to the articles that I <clears throat> provided will be in the description box. Thank the moderators. Thank the brothers who are helping me beatify the YouTube page for the glory of Jesus. Jesus is alive and he's real. And he loves us. May we love him the way he deserves to be loved. Marcy, I said, five, between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time. Take care. Lord bless you.